Hello again, uh, welcome to uh, Channel 514 or SPK Plus, and uh, I hope you're having a, a very happy and blessed Sunday. And today, what I'm going to uh, present is the first installment in our uh, Series 2, in our second uh, series, which is uh, called Exploring Ancient Literature. And like I mentioned in the first uh, video in this series, or in the introduction to the series, uh, what we're going to be doing is uh, taking a different work or a group of works in uh, ancient literature and describing it and introducing it uh, simply uh, in layman's terms and um, in brief, uh, not in, in terribly great detail. And this one, uh, this video is, is going to be pretty experimental and really I'm just uh, doing this off the cuff and I don't have anything written and prepared beforehand uh, to, uh, to work with here. But again, like I mentioned the first time, we're going to be starting with uh, the literature of ancient Mesopotamia. Um, and that is uh, the first center of civilization that we know of, or the first place that we know of where civilization really uh, took off and uh, developed to uh, <laughs> developed and uh, became uh, pretty advanced. And this book here that I have is just a, a general uh, study on uh, the history of uh, the ancient Middle East or the ancient Near East or A-N-E in general, including Mesopotamia and uh, Syria and Palestine, and uh, to a lesser extent Egypt. But it's called Life in the Ancient Near East. Um, the author is Daniel C. Snell, and it's published by uh, Yale University Press, uh, 1997. So it's uh, still uh, pretty current or, or recent. And there's a map here that I want to show it's a uh, map of the Near East. So let me hold that up there. Hopefully this, this works pretty well. This is, uh, right around here is Mesopotamia, the land uh, between the rivers is what that means. Uh, Potamos in Greek, that's river, meso, between, so between the rivers. And you can see the more, uh, the upper part, the northern part, they sometimes call that upper Mesopotamia. Uh, that's traditionally called Assyria. And down here, the southern part is traditionally called uh, Babylonia. Um, and that, Babylonia, is sometimes divided into Sumer, more uh, towards the south, and Akkad, more uh, towards the north. So, um, obviously that's uh, in modern-day Iraq, and you can see over here um, you have uh, Elam, that's uh, mentioned in the Bible, that was a, a group of people that lived in what is now Iran. So you've got Iran, that says Persia there. Um, you've got Asia Minor, which is uh, modern-day Turkey. Uh, Anatolia is another name for that. you got Syria here. Uh, you've got uh, Palestine. Um, so Syria and Palestine and Mesopotamia are what they call the Fertile Crescent. You can see that little crescent shape. And here you got the Arabian Peninsula, and over here Egypt, you got the Nile River, the Red Sea there, and uh, Libya, so going uh, west uh, from Egypt along the coast of North Africa. And then you have uh, here the Mediterranean Sea, you got the island of Cyprus, you got the Caspian Sea way over here, the Black Sea over here. And again, the area we're talking about, or the uh, literature that we're going to be reading, is from Mesopotamia. And let me hold that up a little closer. We can see the names of some of the city-states because uh, Mesopotamia has all these different city-states. So um, let's see, you can see Babylon, hopefully. That's in there. Uh, you've got Akkad. You've got uh, Nippur. Um, that's uh, mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. That's where the uh, exiled uh, Judahites were living in this town called Nippur, which is uh, near Babylon. Um, you've got Ur, where Abraham comes from, and Uruk. Um, 
Sipar, um, Nineveh probably uh, is in there, although I can't uh, quite see it right here. Uh, Asur, um, that's what Assyria is named after, this city, uh, Asur, or Ashur. So let's see, anything else? Um, well, anyway, that's um, that's an idea of the uh, the land that we're talking about. And again, it's Mesopotamia. That means between the rivers, and uh, it's in modern day Iraq, basically mostly. So, um, the literature that we're going to be uh, starting to talk about is uh, mainly uh, I'm going to be getting it from this book, uh, Myths from Mesopotamia, and that's uh, from Oxford World's Classics. Uh, so Oxford University Press, uh, 1989, and this is the revised edition from 2000. Uh, the translator uh, is a, a scholar named Stephanie Daly. So, and I use this in uh, several of the, or at least uh, one or two, um, or maybe just one of our uh, studies that um, in our 10-part series. So, um, the works of literature that we're going to be talking about from Mesopotamia are going to be the ones that are more literary. So let me say a few words about that. Um, maybe you've heard in Mesopotamia and the ancient Near East they used a system of writing called cuneiform. That's wedge-shaped letters. So they tend to be these pointy little letters that look kind of crabbed and tight to us and they have uh, sharp edges and that's why they get the name uh, wedge shaped or cuneiform. Um, and so that's the earliest known system of writing and uh, most of the writing in this uh, alphabet um, is in the language in, a, in an early uh, a very ancient Semitic language called Akkadian. Before that, there were there was a uh, a group of uh, people in the city states of Lower Mesopotamia called the Sumerians. Uh, their land is traditionally called Sumer, and um, they probably invented the cuneiform system of writing themselves. But um, after the rise of the Akkadian kingdom, most of the literature and most of the writing of, of all kinds was done in the Akkadian language in these cuneiform letters. And so there's all kinds of uh, writing that we have from this time. For example, when they built a building, they would make a, a clay tablet and write on it in cuneiform all about who built this building. So, you know, a king or a nobleman built this building in a certain year, in like the fifth year of the reign of this king, and it's uh, the building was meant to be used for this or for that, and they would then place that tablet in the foundations of the building, and it would stay there as a record of the uh, of the building. And if it was torn down at some point, then um, you could check that tablet and uh, see what had been there before. Um, so also there's a lot of uh, records kept by kings and by merchants and business people. So records of sales and transactions and inventory and that kind of thing. Um, you also have uh, law codes like the uh, famous Code of Hammurabi. Um, you've probably heard of that and you've probably seen um, I should show a picture of it. In one of these videos, I'll show a picture of it. It's a big slab of basalt, and it's written all over in cuneiform, and that's where we get this uh, series of laws that you call, that's called the Law Code of Hammurabi, um, after the king um, who promulgated this uh, law code. And there's actually, he's not the only one, there's really a, a large literature of these law codes. So in our series, though, we're not really going to be looking at the law codes or at the uh, dedicatory tablets from the foundations of buildings or at what the merchants and the kings were buying and selling and having in stock and all of that. Um, it's interesting, but mainly from a, an archaeological or scholarly perspective. And 
what we're going to be doing here is is uh, looking at their their more creative literature and trying to get a sense of um, what was on their minds um, at the time that this literature was being written. So. Uh, just a few more words about Mesopotamian society in general. As I said, there were all different city-states, and different ethnic groups and different tribes of people would move into the land over time and uh, bring their culture with them, and some of them were more warlike, and some, you know, conquered some of the land. So you have the rise and fall of many different kingdoms and powers, uh, over time in this same territory, but over but throughout that time the culture uh, This broad cultural realm is pretty consistent and so you find uh, some of the same ideas and preoccupations and beliefs uh, persisting over a long time even as different people move in and different kingdoms rise and fall and uh, It's also an agricultural society and maybe you've heard of the way that in Egypt they had the Nile floods. The Nile River would flood every year, and the land kind of um, took care of itself in that way. Um, the farmers grew crops, but they could always count on the Nile flooding. And if it weren't for the Nile, their land would be a desert, and that's why Herodotus called Egypt the gift of the Nile. Um, in Mesopotamia, you do have these two big rivers, uh, the Tigris and the Euphrates. The Euphrates more west and the Tigris more east. But um, they uh, didn't have these annual floods, although they did sometimes have floods unexpectedly that would be disastrous, or sometimes the rivers would flow very slightly, and that also would be uh, dangerous or... Uh, or um, that would cause trouble or cause uh, poorer crops. And so they would dig canals and irrigate the land. And so they had a, mo they had a lot um, more work, really, uh, a lot, um, a much harder uh, uh, life and uh, keeping agriculture going and keeping um, keeping uh, people fed and keeping uh, keeping everything uh, stable and productive and keeping the land well irrigated, um, that was a lot harder for the Mesopotamians than it was uh, for the Egyptian uh, farmers. So that's kind of a preoccupation that you find in, in Mesopotamian literature is that it's so much work to survive and keep the uh, keep the crops growing, keep the land fertile and productive. And so man has a hard life and it's uh, the gods don't really have much pity on our sufferings and life is just full of danger and full of uh, trouble and ultimately there's not much that one can do about it. Um, one just has to take the good with the bad and uh, be ready for the worst at any time. And so um, the first uh, pieces of literature in this book that I think are, uh, are something that we uh, should talk about well, the first is uh, called Atrahasis, and we read from this in our, uh, our third study in our 10-part series, Because of You or Just Because. This is the just because part of the equation, because in this text, the gods make humans so that they uh, won't, so that the humans can do the work for them, because for some reason the gods themselves have to work to keep the land uh, fertile. So the name, the character Atrahasis, that's the Noah-like figure who is uh, preserved by the gods when they decide to flood the earth, and he builds a boat and he survives, and then they make him immortal, so he lives forever after that. And so um, something that's uh, 
something that um, makes this text um, or gives it a place in, in popular culture is that right at the beginning you have uh, this statement that the god's load was too great, the work too hard, the trouble too much. The great Anunnaki made the Igigi carry the workload sevenfold. So, um, so it's saying you have two groups of gods, and one of them is making the other work the earth. So one is more powerful and one is less powerful, and uh, maybe one is older, one is younger. I don't think it specifically says that in here. Uh, maybe it does. Um, I should uh, I should really clarify that, but. Um, so, you know, if, you, uh, if you've uh, ever come across any of these uh, authors, um, these sort of speculative authors who, uh, and these uh, conspiracy theorists who uh, think that, or claim that, uh, that these Anunnaki and Igigi, that these are like spacemen or something, that they, uh, they're ancient astronauts, you know, they, um, they came from, you know, the stars and they taught people to uh, grow crops and farm the land as if uh, people could never have figured that out. Um, that's, uh, that's sort of a pop cultural explanation of this text, Atrahasis. Um, and of course, um, for my money, that's uh, total bunk. And there's nothing, uh, there's no truth to that. This is just, um, this is just one version of uh, these people's attempt, these ancient people's attempt to explain why things are the way they are. And I think that's just something man naturally does, is uh, tell stories and um, come up with ways of explaining why things are the way they are. Not always just things like the sun rising and setting, or um, plants growing, or, or things like that, but uh, why, why do we experience life the way we do? Uh, why does it feel a certain way to be human? Um, why is there suffering? Um, and that, uh, and, and questions like that. So, what happens in this text with these two groups of gods, the Anunnaki who are more powerful and the Igigi who are less powerful, is that uh, some of these less powerful gods, they get together and they, uh, they think they want to rebel against the more powerful ones. And um, they bring this, uh, they bring their concerns to the leader of the more powerful gods. And what does, uh, what do they decide to do but make humans? So the humans will uh, bear the load of the gods. One way I've heard it said is man, uh, man must carry the work basket of the gods. So, um, so they do that, they make humans, and uh, they do that by uh, killing one of their own, uh, one of their own fellows, one of the gods, who, uh, and they make humans out of his body, you know, so he's kind of sacrificed um, in order to, to make us. So now, we do the work so they don't have to, we suffer so they don't have to, we have it hard so they can have a nice life, you know, in their, their uh, heavenly realm that they live in. Um, and I guess if they came from outer space or something and they had, you know, spaceships and they could travel, you know, through the galaxy or whatever, then uh, they probably wouldn't need us to grow crops for them and, and that kind of thing. But, you know, but um, I'm just uh, explaining or uh, poking fun at, at these uh, theories or these sort of speculative notions about... Uh, about this, uh, these, this literature, um, to uh, sort of uh, warn anyone who's interested in this kind of thing not to uh, not to be uh, dazzled by um, anyone uh, claiming to be uh, an expert or to uh, or to uh, 
be revealing some kind of hidden history or, or uh, you know, blowing open some uh, secret that someone's trying to keep from you or something like that. Um, so anyway, the humans, uh, it says, uh, here I'll start from uh, Tablet 2, and this version, um, there are different versions of this text, even in this book there's Atrahasis 1, 2, and 3. I'm really only talking about the first one, or working with that one, and, and uh, that's really all we need to do for our purposes here. But uh, here at the beginning of the second tablet, remember these are written on clay tablets, we have 600 years, less than 600, passed, and the country became too wide, the people too numerous. The country was as noisy as a bellowing bull. The god grew restless at their clamor. Elil had to listen to their noise. He addressed the great gods. The noise of mankind has become too much. I am losing sleep over their racket. Cut off food supplies to the people. Let the vegetation be too scant for their hunger. Let Adad wipe away his rain. Below, let no flood water flow from the springs. Let wind go, let it strip the ground bare. Let clouds gather, but not drop rain. Let the field yield a diminished harvest. Let Nisaba stop up her bosom. No happiness shall come to them. Then there's a big gap in the text, but anyway, you get the point. Um, the gods make us, the humans, but uh, they don't really like us that much, and we... Uh, we make a lot of noise, and we, we, they can't sleep because we're making all this noise. And so they cause uh, disasters, they cause um, droughts and things like that. And eventually what happens is they uh, decide to flood the earth and wipe out all the humans, except for this one character, Atrahasis, and in the uh, Gilgamesh epic he's called Utanapishti, but they let him live, they warn him so he can build a boat, they tell him how to build the boat and everything. And so he survives, and then they make him immortal. And after this, they decide that uh, humans live too long, and that's why they overpopulate and cause so much trouble and make so much noise. So what they do is, uh, is uh, shorten the lifespan of human beings so that they only live a little while and there won't get to be too many of them. Now, let's see if there's anything else really that we want to bring up before uh, cutting this off. And again, this is just, this is really pretty experimental. I'm really just, uh, um, I'm not prepared for this. I'm just uh, firing it out um, as, it, as it comes, as it comes to me. So, let's see, oh now I'm into the second one. You can see how unprepared I am here. Oh, I see. Ah, here's, we can just maybe uh, read some of the last few lines here. These are the gods uh, deciding about how they're going to change things for people to uh, make them less of a problem for the gods. Let one third of them be, uh, and then there's a gap. In addition, let there be one third of the people among the people, the woman who gives birth yet does not give birth successfully. Let there be the Pashitu demon among the people to snatch the baby from its mother's lap. Establish Ugbabtu, Entu, Egishitu women. They shall be taboo, and thus control childbirth. So they make these evil beings to uh, keep um, more humans from being born, to uh, cause miscarriages, and, <clears throat> and things of that nature. So, um, that's pretty much the end there. So, the main point of Atrahasis uh, one of the more important uh, classics of uh, ancient Mesopotamia is uh, that the gods create man so he can bear the load of the gods. So we suffer so that they can be happy. And uh, then that they flood the earth and they make our life more perilous and more... Um, 
precarious so that we don't get to be too numerous and so that we don't uh, disturb them too much. And uh, one man survives the flood and uh, then the earth is repopulated and this one guy gets to uh, live forever um, just as a special favor. So that's, uh, that's Atrahasis, that's our uh, introduction to uh, Mesopotamian literature, and uh, I'll see how well this came out and if it uh, seems uh, fair enough for, uh, to uh, add to the uh, series, then I'll post it. So, Thanks for, uh, thanks for your patience, uh, thanks for watching this all the way through, or part of it, or however much you, you care to watch, and uh, have a blessed Sunday, and a great week, and hopefully we'll be seeing you soon.